Having a written legal will is important, but more than half of Aussie adults don't have one. Vision has entered into a partnership with SafeWill, a leading online will writing platform to provide you with an easier and more affordable way to write or update your will. As part of the Vision family, we want you to know about a way that you can write your will for free. Start the process now and complete it at no cost during Leave a Legacy Week from February 26 to March 3rd. See all the details at vision.org.au slash legacy. A biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. It's an opportunity today as we preview one of the best speaking tours that you'll see this year. The Living in Babylon tour is just a couple of weeks away. It starts in Adelaide on the 28th of February and then with dates in Brisbane, in Perth and in Melbourne in early March. Martin Isles, the executive CEO of Answers in Genesis and Ken Ham, the founding CEO, will be sharing the platform. Babylon is a biblical city and a symbol of evil, corruption and tyranny. Well, comparisons between Australia and biblical Babylon are triggering a new engagement in what's considered a robust battle for civilization. Now, you'll know Martin Isles, who was for five years so well known to us for his work at the helm of the Australian Christian Lobby. And you'll remember that of recent times over this past 12 months, he's moved into an international platform with the large US-based apologetics and education ministry, Answers in Genesis. Our special guest this hour is Martin Isles, now in his new role as Executive CEO of Answers in Genesis. Hey Martin, a special welcome back to 2020. G'day Neil, it's good to be back again. Hey Martin, let's jump into the deep end right at the start here. Um, Babylon, a biblical city, and a symbol of evil, corruption, and tyranny. Uh, How accurate is that uh, when we start to make comparisons for nations like Australia or like the US, where you're based these days? Well, it is accurate, um, and there's some other points as well to be gleaned from what the Bible says about Babylon. Uh, As you mentioned, it is, of course, a historic place that is particularly dealt with in the book of Daniel, but is referred to in other parts of the Bible as well. And the thing about Babylon it wa- is that it was the God-rejecting culture. Uh, you think of the Israelites. They're living uh, in, in Jerusalem, and of course they are a nation established by God. Uh, it is a nation established on God-fearing principles, uh, on a godly culture, and you might almost make comparisons there with a Western culture that was established on Christian foundations or Judeo-Christian foundations. And uh, what happens? Uh, well, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, comes to Jerusalem, lays siege to it, and uh, conquers Jerusalem. And a group of these people from a God-fearing cultural fabric are taken away into a brand new culture. Uh, people like Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, and they find themselves in a whole new world. Uh, they're suddenly in a God-opposing culture. They're, current, they're suddenly in a pagan culture, a culture that's built on values of human pride, uh, of you know rebellious uh, social and cultural ethics. And they've got to adjust themselves. They suddenly have to ask, well, God has allowed this cultural change to happen, and now we're stuck in it. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to live fruitfully for God in an ungodly nation? And that really is the point of living in Babylon. It is to say the West has changed. The culture is different. We are now living in post-Christian times. We're living in times marked by woke ideologies, postmodern ideologies, anti-God ideologies, and Christians stand out like they didn't stand out before. Uh, what? How do we understand the culture we're in, this Babylon-type culture, and how should we therefore live in it fruitfully for God? A God-rejecting culture, and as I said as I was introducing you, it's been the trigger for a new engagement 
Uh, and really, this other terminology that I mentioned there in the introduction, a battle for civilization, and we're talking primarily about Western nations. This includes Australia and includes uh, the United States and the UK and Europe. Western nations, a battle for civilization. Is that too big a call? Well, it's certainly, look, it's not too big a call. Um, I would I would say that when you look at Babylon in Scripture, it actually starts at the city of Babel in Genesis 11. It's interesting, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream where his empire is sort of likened to uh, Babel-type imagery, and the same in Isaiah 14 where God condemns Babylon. This uh, Babylon is just an example of something. It's an example of a culture, a human system of power that opposes God, that rejects God. And that begins at the city of Babel. We see it expressed in Babylon. We see it in the Roman Empire. And the Bible calls Nineveh Babylon in one place and Tyre Babylon in another place. And and really what it is, is, it, is it's a battle for, um, it's really a battle for uh, who, what is God? Uh, you know, Babylons are always built on pride. They make human beings like gods. They they, they, they try and take God's authority away from him. Um, you know, you think of Babel, what do they say? They say, come, let us make a name for ourselves. It's all about human pride. It's all about raising up people to the status of gods. And we see a lot of that in our culture at the moment. Um, you can think of so many of the things that are promoted by the culture, things that are uh, dominating the political debates of the day. They're things like the gender debate. Uh, and, you know, God made male and female and he gave that creation reality meaning. But we come along and we say, no, no, we want to apply our own meaning to that. We don't care what God has done. We care what we want to do. And so you see this pride. It's raising ourselves up to be like God, to take something he's made, something he's defined, and to take control of it and to destroy it and to make it in our image. And so that's human pride. That's the pride of Babel. That's the pride of Babylon. And, and the government comes along with its funding of hospitals and gender clinics and its education programs and, and targeting young people. And it uses its power and it uses its infrastructure to promote that view that we can be like God in the matter of gender. Uh, and that's just one example. Uh, you can think of so many others. The sexuality thing is the same. Human Men and women are designed sexually for each other. That's just evident in the way we're created. The Apostle Paul notes that in Romans 1. But we come along and say, yes, so what? We don't care what God has done. We want to be like God. We want to decide that there's other categories, homosexual, bisexual, queer. Uh, and it's the same as well uh, in, in the relation to the race issue. You know, God makes one human race. We're, we're all one human family. Uh, we're all saved by the same gospel. We all live in the same truth. But of course, the, the, the race politics types come along and say, oh, no, no, uh, the racial groups are impossibly divided. Uh, you know, we can never reconcile with each other. We're always going to be oppressing. The white guy will oppress the black guy and the black guy will be a victim. And, and there's no solution. And that's what they actually preach if you read the books that they write on this stuff. And again, it's us looking at race and we're making ourselves like God. We're redefining what it really is. You know, God made us all with a tremendous equality um, and so on and so on. And you see this this pride ethic, this, you know, people want to recreate what God has created. They want to redefine what God has defined. And I think that that is actually the thing that connects so many of the political debates and the culture wars debates of our day. And that's just classic Babylon. It's classic Babel. Martin, you've moved into this new role, uh, the executive CEO, Answers in Genesis, and uh, you've moved to a global platform much bigger than most people will appreciate. And uh, we've talked about those sorts of things before. But you've got a wonderful gift to be able to articulate these things the way you do. And so many listeners will be very familiar with that. When you are up in front of a crowd and you are connecting Genesis in a way that people have not been used to hearing Genesis before. When you are saying that Genesis has answers for this generation today, people are, what's, the, what's their reaction? I'm, I'm assuming that people are getting blown away by this because for somehow or other, uh, we've been lulled into this fo false sense of security that Genesis is somehow or other removed. It's just a story at the start of the Bible, but 
this is reality and you're articulating these things, what sort of response are you getting from audiences you're speaking to around the world? Uh, an incredibly positive response, Neil. I would say, um, I would, I would. There's a kind of excitement that people have when they join the dots in their brain. When, when, when they, when they look, they're confused by the world around them. They look at what's going on in the culture, and they look at how that you know Western cultures changed, and then they look at the identity stuff, uh, and then they look at the race politics stuff. They look at climate change issues. Uh, they look at all this stuff about my truth and your truth, and they think, well, what does all that mean? What about the truth? And then they're called bigots for believing in the truth. You know, and and people are seeing seeing all of this and experiencing it and it's causing a lot of confusion and bewilderment and uncertainty and they want to know uh, how to cut through it all. Where's the clarity? Where are the strong foundations that answer this in a way that makes sense? Uh, and when you give them the biblical blueprints and you say, actually, it's all very simple, you know, bring it back to basics. The Genesis is the book of blueprints. It's the book of foundations. And if you look in Genesis, you're going to find a lot of foundations some of them seem a bit less relevant to our present cultural moment. Some of them are incredibly relevant to our pre present cultural moment. And when people join those dots, when they go, oh, that's the answer to that issue, they get very excited. And I'm, I found that in Australia. I used to do a series called Genesis Blueprints with young people because, of course, all of this stuff is very much turning their world upside down. But when you come along and say there is a place you can look, there is a foundation you can have which just answers it all with clarity and gives you a blueprint for your life, they get very excited. And I see that now in America. I see that in Australia. And I've been to the UK and I was in Costa Rica the other day. Uh, wherever I go, this message has cut through because these are the issues of today. And, of course, the word of God is a word for every generation. And the answers are there. You're getting ready to jump on a plane and come back to Australia. The tour, the Living in Babylon tour is coming up. Adelaide, February the 28th at the Adelaide Convention Centre. So uh, these are not just little uh, old wooden churches in the back blocks of uh, suburb, suburban communities. Uh, these are major centres. Adelaide on the 28th of February, you're into Brisbane on the 2nd of March at the Brisbane Convention and Exhibition Centre. You'll be talking in Perth at the Perth Convention and Exhibition Centre on the 4th of March. Then Melbourne, March the 9th at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. Uh, are there still tickets available? As I understand it, there's some, some of those venues are already sold out. What's, what's the status there? Well, I mean, um, it's it's a huge blessing to be able to say that Brisbane is completely sold out. Um, so that's very exciting. But there is a live stream option if people go to the website. It's an opportunity today as we preview one of the best speaking tours that you'll see this year. The Living in Babylon tour is just a couple of weeks away. It starts in Adelaide on the 28th of February and then with dates in Brisbane, in Perth and in Melbourne in early March. Martin Isles, the executive CEO of Answers in Genesis, and Ken Ham, the founding CEO, will be sharing the platform. Babylon is a biblical city and a symbol of evil, corruption and tyranny. Well, comparisons between Australia and biblical Babylon are triggering a new engagement in what's considered a robust battle for civilization. Now, you'll know Martin Isles, who was for five years so well known to us for his work at the helm of the Australian Christian Lobby. And you'll remember that of recent times over this past 12 months, he's moved into an international platform with the large US-based apologetics and education ministry, Answers in Genesis. Our special guest this hour is Martin Isles, now in his new role as Executive CEO of Answers in Genesis. Hey Martin, a special welcome back to 2020. G'day Neil, it's good to be back again. Hey Martin, let's jump into the deep end right at the start here. Um, Babylon, uh, a biblical city, and a symbol of evil, corruption, and tyranny. Uh, how accurate is that uh, when we start to make comparisons for nations like Australia or like the US, where you're based these days? 
Well, it is accurate, um, and there's some other points as well to be gleaned from what the Bible says about Babylon. Uh, as you mentioned, it is, of course, a historic place that is particularly dealt with in the book of Daniel, but is referred to in other parts of the Bible as well. And the thing about Babylon it were, is that it was the God-rejecting culture. Uh, you think of the Israelites. They're living uh, in, in Jerusalem. And of course, they are a nation established by God. Uh, it is a nation established on God-fearing principles, uh, on a godly culture. And you might almost make comparisons there with a Western culture that was established on Christian foundations or Judeo-Christian foundations. And what happens? Uh, well, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, comes to Jerusalem, lays siege to it, and uh, conquers Jerusalem. And a group of these people from a God-fearing cultural fabric are taken away into a brand new culture. Uh, people like Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. And they find themselves in a whole new world. Uh, they're suddenly in a God-opposing culture. They're, current, they're suddenly in a pagan culture. A culture that's built on values of human pride, uh, of you know rebellious uh, social and cultural ethics. And they've got to adjust themselves. They suddenly have to ask, well, God has allowed this cultural change to happen, and now we're stuck in it. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to live fruitfully for God in an ungodly nation? And that really is the point of living in Babylon. It is to say the West has changed. The culture is different. We are now living in post-Christian times. We're living in times marked by woke ideologies, postmodern ideologies, anti-God ideologies, and Christians stand out like they didn't stand out before. Uh, what, how do we understand the culture we're in, this Babylon-type culture, and how should we therefore live in it fruitfully for God? A God-rejecting culture, and as I said as I was introducing you, it's been the trigger for a new engagement. Uh, and really, this other terminology that I mentioned there in the introduction, a battle for civilization, and we're talking primarily about Western nations. This includes Australia, and includes uh, the United States and the UK and Europe. Western nations, a battle for civilization. Is that too big a call? Well, it's certainly, look, it's not too big a call. Um, I, would, I would say that when you look at Babylon in Scripture, it actually starts at the city of Babel in Genesis 11. It's interesting, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream where his empire is sort of likened to uh, Babel-type imagery, and the same in Isaiah 14 where God condemns Babylon. This, uh, Babylon is just an example of something. It's an example of a culture, a human system of power that opposes God, that rejects God. And that begins at the city of Babel. We see it expressed in Babylon. We see it in the Roman Empire. And the Bible calls Nineveh Babylon in one place and Tyre Babylon in another place. And, and really what it is, is, it, is it's a battle for, um, it's really a battle for uh, who, what is God? Uh, you know, Babylons are always built on pride. They make human beings like gods. They they, they, they try and take God's authority away from him. Um, you know, you think of Babel, what do they say? They say, come, let us make a name for ourselves. It's all about human pride. It's all about raising up people to the status of gods. And we see a lot of that in our culture at the moment. Um, you can think of so many of the things that are promoted by the culture, things that are uh, dominating the political debates of the day. They're things like the gender debate. Uh, and, you know, God made male and female, and he gave that creation reality meaning. But we come along and we say, no, no, we want to apply our own meaning to that. We don't care what God has done. We care what we want to do. And so you see this pride. It's raising ourselves up to be like God, to take something he's made, something he's defined and to take control of it and to destroy it and to make it in our image. 
And so that's human pride. That's the pride of Babel. That's the pride of Babylon. And, and the government comes along with its funding of hospitals and gender clinics and its education programs uh, and targeting young people. And it uses its power and it uses its infrastructure to promote that view that we can be like God in the matter of gender. Uh, and that's just one example. Uh, you can think of so many others. The sexuality thing is the same. Human Men and women are designed sexually for each other. That's just evident in the way we're created. The Apostle Paul notes that in Romans 1. But we come along and say, yes, so what? We don't care what God has done. We want to be like God. We want to decide that there's other categories, homosexual, bisexual, queer. Uh, and it's the same as well. Uh, in, in the relation to the race issue, you know, God makes one human race. We're, we're all one human family. Uh, we're all saved by the same gospel. We all live in the same truth. But of course, the, the, the race politics types come along and say, oh, no, no, uh, the racial groups are impossibly divided. Uh, you know, we can never reconcile with each other. We're always going to be oppressing. The white guy will oppress the black guy and the black guy will be a victim. And, and there's no solution. And that's what they actually preach if you read the books that they write on this stuff. And again, it's us looking at race and we're making ourselves like God. We're redefining what it really is. You know, God made us all with a tremendous equality um, and so on and so on. And you see this this pride ethic, this, you know, people want to recreate what God has created. They want to redefine what God has defined. And I think that that is actually the thing that connects so many of the political debates and the culture wars debates of our day. And that's just classic Babylon. It's classic Babel. Martin, you've moved into this new role, uh, the executive CEO, Answers in Genesis, and uh, you've moved to a global platform much bigger than most people will appreciate. And uh, we've talked about those sorts of things before. But you've got a wonderful gift to be able to articulate these things the way you do. And so many listeners will be very familiar with that. When you are up in front of a crowd and you are connecting Genesis in a way that people have not been used to hearing Genesis before. When you are saying that Genesis has answers for this generation today, people are, what's, the, what's their reaction? I'm, I'm assuming that people are getting blown away by this because for somehow or other, uh, we've been lulled into this fo false sense of security that Genesis is somehow or other removed. It's just a story at the start of the Bible, but this is reality and you're articulating these things. What sort of response are you getting from audiences you're speaking to around the world? Uh, an incredibly positive response, Neil. I would say um, I would I would there's a kind of excitement that people have when they join the dots in their brain, when 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 they when they look, they're confused by the world around them. They look at what's going on in the culture and they look at how that, you know, Western cultures changed. And then they look at the identity stuff. Uh, and then they look at the race politics stuff. They look at climate change issues. Uh, they look at all this stuff about my truth and your truth. And they think, well, what does all that mean? What about the truth? And then they're called bigots for believing in the truth, you know. And, and people are seeing all of this and experiencing it. And it's causing a lot of confusion and bewilderment and uncertainty. And they want to know uh, how to cut through it all. Where's the clarity? Where are the strong foundations that answer this in a way that makes sense? Uh, and when you give them the biblical blueprints and you say, actually, it's all very simple, you know, bring it back to basics. The, Genesis is the book of blueprints. It's the book of foundations. And if you look in Genesis, you're going to find a lot of foundations some of them seem a bit less relevant to our present cultural moment. Some of them are incredibly relevant to our pre present cultural moment. And when people join those dots, when they go, oh, that's the answer to that issue, they get very excited. And I'm, I found that in Australia. I used to do a series called Genesis Blueprints with young people because, of course, all of this stuff is very much turning their world upside down. But when you come along and say there is a place you can look, there is a foundation you can have which just answers it all with clarity and gives you a blueprint for your life, they get very excited. And I see that now in America. I see that in Australia. And I've been to the UK and I was in Costa Rica the other day. Uh, wherever I go, this message has cut through because these are the issues of today. And, of course, the word of God is a word for every generation and the answers are there. You're getting ready to jump on a plane and come back to Australia. The tour, the Living in Babylon tour is coming up. Adelaide, February the 28th at the Adelaide Convention Centre. So uh, these are not just little uh, old wooden churches in the back blocks of uh, suburb, suburban communities. Uh, these are major centres. 
Adelaide on the 28th of February. You're into Brisbane on the 2nd of March at the Brisbane Convention and Exhibition Centre. You'll be talking in Perth at the Perth Convention and Exhibition Centre on the 4th of March. Then Melbourne, March the 9th at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. Uh, are there still tickets available? As I understand it, there's some some of those venues are already sold out. What's what's the status there? Well, I mean, um, it's it's a huge blessing to be able to say that Brisbane is completely sold out. Um, so that's very exciting. But there is a live stream option. If people go to the website to register, they'll see a live stream option for Brisbane available now since it is full. But there are still tickets in Adelaide, Melbourne, and Perth. So you will still find availability at the moment. Don't delay, but you will find availability there if you visit uh, the livinginbabylon.com website. Hey, talking living in Babylon, Martin. Um, Babylon uh, doesn't feel evil, I imagine, at the start because Babylon is very seductive. Uh, The hostility comes later when you stand up against the seduction of the city of Babylon. Give us your insights here into how we might understand the way Babylon looks uh, from biblical times and a comparison to the present. Yeah, that's a really good point, Neil. And it's another one of the reasons why the Western world fits the Babylon metaphor that's given in the Bible. Uh, namely, that one of the things about Babylon cultures is that they're always very rich. <laughs> you know, they're always wealthy. They always have a lot to offer their residents. They have a lot to offer the people that live there. And of course, the Western world at the moment would surely be about the most prosperous and, uh, you know, society that the world's ever seen. And that prosperity is widely available to ordinary people. And you think of just an example. I mean, this this prosperity comes out time and again in the Bible, but let's go in on one example. Think of Daniel in Daniel 1. And Daniel's been taken from Jerusalem and is being brought into Babylon. And you start reading about all the seductions, all the temptations, all the good things that are being offered to him. You know, he gets a special place in a very elite university type program. It's like he gets a, a spot in Harvard University, you know, the king's own university, if we put it that way. He gets a guaranteed job in the White House of Babylon, a guaranteed job in the king's palace. Uh, he gets an incredible education. And then uh, he's he's served all this amazing food, you know, uh, and he's close to power. He's got all the great food and, 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 and sort of um, good life type things that he can imagine. And he's got an opportunity before him. And that's the seduction. It's like, look what we can give you, Daniel. But there comes a point where they say, we will give you all of this if you live a certain way, if you behave a certain way, if you're one of us. And that's when Daniel draws the line and he says, well, I'm happy to go along with this until you ask me to commit a sin, until you ask me to compromise. And that's where I draw the line. And full credit to Daniel, he resisted that temptation of the good life. And we're the same today. You know, you think of young people going into careers, young people in big secular universities. You think of how that you can be excluded from a social group because of your Christian conviction. They might challenge you. What do you think about transgenderism? You know, and straight away you're, 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 you're on the spot and your answer could be could cost you a promotion. Your answer could cost you friends. Your answer could, you know, the seduction is there to compromise And the Daniels in Babylon don't compromise. Uh, And that's one of the defining features of not only Babylon, but how we're supposed to respond to it. Is there a seduction that takes us as Christian believers to the idea that the good life is our goal too? Uh, Because in some sense here, if we're going to compare ourselves with Daniel and his mates, uh, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, uh, clearly the good life was not their goal. And uh, but here we are. 21st century Australian society, as you've described it, uh, prosperous, uh, sex and sexuality at the centre of everything, money, uh, power. Uh, The good life for a lot of people is the goal. Where ought Christians sit with that sort of place? Well, that's absolutely the point. I mean, um, the comfortable life, I think, is the Australian temptation. In America over here, there's always a big hustle. Everyone wants to get ahead. Everyone wants to wants to get rich. Everybody wants to get powerful. In Australia, people want a comfortable life. They want an easy life. They want a life that is just, you know, uh, as steady as she goes, happy-go-lucky, she'll be right. You know, that's what Australians really desire. Uh, and, you know, 
to have that as your highest value and easy life, it means you'll never really stand up against the sin of Babylon. You'll never really make the right decision when your day comes to either compromise and go along with the culture or draw a line and stand apart and say, no, I'm going to serve God, not what this culture is asking me to do. You know, you need to make the decision there that you're not just out for the comfortable, easy life. You're actually out to serve God first and foremost. He is your highest value. What he expects of you and requires of you is your is is the highest value. And and it is, you know, it's an act of faith because in doing so, you're trusting God with the future. You know, you might think that, oh, by taking a stand, by saying that, by answering that question, by witnessing to that person, by not going along with this sin, I'm going to lose something. I'm going to lose friends. I'm going to lose a promotion. I'm going to lose status. Well, you might or you might not. That's in God's hands, right? God says, those who honor me, I will honor. And Daniel took the risk. He said, well, I could lose everything, but I'm going to serve God as my highest value. And you know what? God looked after him. You know, I had a conversation on 2020 just the other day, and uh, you probably didn't hear it, but we were talking about a new book called The Unlucky Country, uh, Augusto Zimmerman, who I think you know, but uh, the comparison was to the book that was released back in the 1960s by Donald Horn, which was called The Lucky Country, and the terminology um, misinterpreted, and these days we talk about the lucky country as a term of endearment. Just like you were saying, we just like this thought that we're comfortable and uh, we're in a good place and we're removed from all of the turmoil and the chaos that's going on around the world. For Christian believers in Australia, and uh, let's get a little bit pointed here, and I won't mind, and I'm sure listeners won't mind if you, uh, you know, shoot from the hip, uh, tell us like it is. Are we a little bit too complacent, too comfortable? And what has to change, Martin? if we're going to be effectively resistant to rising Babylon in Australia? It's interesting you say this, Neil. Um, One of the teachings in the Bible is that comfort and ease and wealth uh, can be our greatest spiritual enemy. Uh, In fact, Jesus uh, says that to the Laodicean church in Revelation chapter 3. He says, you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I lack nothing. You know, you say you're the lucky ones, <laughs> to use the lucky country uh, example. But he says, and you do not realize that you are poor and blind and miserable and naked, therefore repent. In other words, you feel so comfortable every day that you haven't realized that you're spiritually actually not in a good place at all. And you're The comfort you experience in your daily life is actually your spiritual enemy. You're not putting spiritual things first because you don't feel your need and your poverty uh, sufficiently. And I I think that is always the risk that faces a church in a wealthy or a prosperous place or a peaceful place. Um, And what it does, of course, is that we don't want to upset that peace and harmony. And so, you know, you know, it may be that something there's a really bad thing going on in the kids school. And we don't have the courage to go down to the school and deal with it because it will cause trouble. And we don't want to have trouble. We want comfort. We want ease. Or it might be that a situation arises at work, uh, let's say a wear it purple day or something. And we and we don't want to not go along with it because we just think, oh, wow, that'll make my life hard. I'll have to give an account for what I believe and it'll get awkward. And so we compromise because we want to be comfortable. I think that that has got to be one of the biggest snares that Christians in Western countries face right now. Is the Christian who lives in Babylon required to be something of an irritant uh, to some of these uh, woke things that are overtaking our schools and our communities? Uh, Are we actually called to be a little bit irritating? Is that what salt and light may be? Yes, well, I think that the salt and light thing is an excellent uh, place to go. And I think Daniel is a great example of salt and light. And what it means to be the salt of the earth and not to allow the salt to lose its taste, it, it, in a nutshell, it means make sure you don't compromise because salt loses its taste when moisture seeps into it, when the environment that it's sitting in seeps inside of it and changes it. And you can see the metaphor straight away. If we allow the culture around us to get to us and to change us and to compromise us, uh, then that's wrong. We're not being the salt. And you see, Daniel did not allow that. 
he didn't allow the culture around him to change him. You know, the edict goes out from King Darius to make sure you don't pray to God for 30 days. He says, no, I'm not going to be changed by that edict. I'm going to be salt. I'm going to keep praying to God with my window open. You know, they come along and say, here, eat this food, which for him would have been sinful to eat. And he says, no, I'm going to be the salt. I'm not going to compromise. And so at the very least, every one of us is called to not compromise at the very least. We need to draw lines in the sand and say we will not allow this culture to compromise our godliness and our stand for God. And then beyond that, we need to find ways to be the light of the world. That is to be seen doing good, speaking truth so that people might know that we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, know that we are God fearing people and that they might see what we're doing. And here's the great thing. Whenever Daniel did that, whenever he did that, God worked through him. His witness came alive in Babylon. You know, it looked scary. It was hostile. Uh, there was a seduction there, which he had to reject. And somehow, you know, he went to the lion's den. He went to the fiery furnace. Every time that happened, God used him in Babylon to reach the culture and reach people. And we need to have more confidence that God will work through us when we take those stands, even when it's difficult. Uh, Martin, let's take some calls. And uh, let's first of all hear from Matthew in South Australia. Hey, Matthew, thanks for waiting so patiently. Oh, thanks, Neil. G'day, Martin. G'day, Matthew. Um, yeah, we um, go to a, a country school, our kids, and um, uh, in December we learned that there was a um, transgender employer just um, on a contract, and um, it concerned my wife and I. And, um, yeah, we um, wrote an email to the board, and then the board actually came out and um, saw us, and they're actually... Um, rallies of ours, um, mine. So, um, and they said it was a rumor and just played it down. Um, but we have friends in the school that we know pretty well and, um, we knew it wasn't. So we thought we needed to make a stand and we sort of sought strength from, um, Gideon. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, um, um, we, Matthew, during... you're making a very good point here. I'm going to bring Martin in because this is becoming the experience uh, widely across lots of schools. And, of course, in Australia, our state school system, well, uh, it's open slather uh, there, but there's also this attack that's happening against Christian schools around employment uh, provisions and such things. Um, Martin, your thoughts for Matthew and uh, what he's experiencing in South Australia? <laughs> Look, this is the this is just about the issue in Christian schools in Australia right now. Uh, it's interesting that in this case it's in the, it's an employee. Um, you know, often it is a student, uh, and the Christian you know a student comes into the school and then identifies as transgender, and then that creates a conversation between say parents and the school to say how will you accommodate the needs of my transgender child what about re um, toilets what about accommodations at camp what about uniform policies surely you're not going to uphold these bigoted policies in the face of uh, you know my needy child and the school buckles over and over again and they say well in this one case we're going to make an exception but what you find in every instance of that happening is that that one case undermines the ethos of the entire school. And it's only a matter of time before you have more of that going on in the school and the school no longer stands for what is right on male and female. It's the ethical issue in Christian schooling, which is dominating right now. And I say uh, I've been sort of shocked that so many people lack the courage to go. To, and the thing about Matthew is it sounds like what he did was he actually went to the school and raised it. And I say, you know, God bless the people who are doing that because um, this needs to be raised and the seriousness of it needs to be pointed out. And we need to clearly draw a line and say it is no love at all that transitions a child. That is not any act of love. That is not any act of Christian compassion. That is not good. I mean, the things that that could lead to in that child's life are absolutely haunting and dreadful uh, in terms of hormones and surgeries and just the pain of that. And we all know how bad it is. Christians need to hold the line on this and say there is such a thing as male and female because God made male and female. And we need to be a witness to the goodness of that. And so parents really do need to go to schools and raise it and call them to account on it carefully with wisdom. And you may fail. 
but it's still right to do it. Or you may actually give the school board the strength that they were looking for, the permission structure they needed to have courage themselves. You know, there's, um, you know, the courage of some can stiffen the spines of others, as Billy Graham uh, is famed for having said. Uh, and I just say that that's our duty. And we may succeed or we may not, but we must raise it uh, in the best way we can. Uh, and hopefully we can save some Christian schools and their ethos as a result. Matthew in South Australia, thank you so much for your call. Our talkback line open 1 800 316 316. You can join in our conversation 1 800 316 316. Before I take another call, just hearkening back to something you said last time we were talking, Martin, and it was about Christian schools, and really you were. Uh, very uh, pointed and even blunt in a prediction that perhaps we are about to see the end of Christian schooling in Australia if these employment uh, rules change for Christian schools. Uh, I just know, too, that there's a huge education component uh, that happens in Answers in Genesis. Uh, The the homeschooling component. Uh, Is this something that you see that a lot of parents will be picking up as an alternative uh, to whatever schooling that they have available to them at the moment? Well, homeschooling in Australia has grown like crazy. I forget the statistics, but it's it's orders of magnitude increase since COVID. Um, And that is going to continue to happen. And the other thing that you alluded to, Neil, was the reality that um, Christian schooling is coming under increased pressure legally so no Christian school wants to be the next school that's in the in the news headlines, like uh, Christian Outreach College was up in Brisbane when they took a stand on the sexuality issue. Christian schools, see, this is the thing about living in Babylon. People don't want to face the trouble. They want ease and comfort. And so they don't want to be in the headlines. They don't want to be held out as nasty people. And so they will compromise because they don't want to face it. Uh, I think some Christians from bygone eras who faced martyrdom would look at us and think we're so pathetic you know we we don't even want to face a little bit of hostility from the culture Uh, but that's that's kind of where we are and the legal pressure is going to increase to the point where i think it's going to be basically impossible for christians to uphold a christian ethos on sexuality and gender and such issues and and be within the law um but see this is where the example of daniel comes in i think what would daniel have done Well, Daniel would have run his Christian school according to the Bible anyway and trusted God. Uh, That's what he would have done. And he would have just said, look, we honor God and God's will be done in this matter. And that's our first calling. That's what we're here to do. And I think we need some more schools and institutions who are prepared to do that, who are prepared to say, here we stand on the word of God and on what we know is right because of because of God's word and God's will. Uh, and we're going to stand for the gospel, and we're going to stand for this ethical truth as well. We're not going to bend, and we trust God for what comes next. And you know what? In the book of Daniel, it was always those high-stakes moments that God used to do really big work in Babylon, to to use people as a witness and a testimony. And I think if we had more confidence in that, uh, we'd be more prepared to stand. Lots of high-stakes moments ahead. Hey, let's take another call. Wendy is in Casino in New South Wales. Uh, Wendy, need to be quick. What are your thoughts? I'm quick. (laughs) I've got a short poem from uh, Martin to read. I was wondering which one of all my poems, because I've got many on this topic. Then I heard him say, Salt and Light. And I thought, oh, I've got a poem called That Very Thing. So I'll read it out. It's only a short one as well. Just the first really stanza, thought, Wendy. Just the first stanza. We've got, uh, we're under time pressure. Hit us with it. So we've got, what, it says, what does it mean to be salt and light that God has called us to? Salt preserves and flavors. Light helps to see and do. Without salt, we are tasteless and good for nothing much. And if we live in darkness, we have to go by touch. But God has got such plans for us to be his hands and feet to show his ways to others and everyone we meet. He's put us on the earth right now and given us our gifts to use to make a difference for such a time as this. For all the world has lost its way. They're groping in the dark. We who have the truth of God need to shine and spark. Wendy, thank you for delivering that poem to us. And uh, I'm going to move on to the next call. But Wendy, thank you so much for calling in from Casino in New South Wales. Let's take another call. Leighton is in Henty. Hey, Leighton, welcome along. Hi, Neil. Hi, Martin. Uh, Good to hear from both of you. Uh, Regular 
we're regular listeners to Vision and especially your program, Neil, and I just wanted to say quickly, you're probably one of the best radio interviewers that I've ever heard. And uh, I have met Martin before at the uh, GPS conference in Canberra, and that really um, changed a lot about my Christian faith and my life. So I wanted to say thank you, Martin, for that. Um, I'll get on to my question. Yep. Martin, I see on Facebook that you uh, said Ken Ham will be taking a, an evangelical angle with his talks. I was just wondering if you could expand a little bit on on that side of the Babylon uh, tour. Fabulous. Martin. Sure. And good to hear from you, Leighton. I know who you are. Big guy, red hair, uh, or tall guy, I should say. Um, so great to hear from you. Um, but yes, so at the Living in Babylon tour, I mean, one of the things we have to do when the culture changes like this, I mean, a lot of people have this kind of political hope that we'll have some kind of political restoration of the West. I just want to say, that's really very unlike. I've been in politics for 10 years, and I'm just here to tell you, you know, don't get your hopes up. Uh, those days are gone uh, for now. Uh, and really what we need to do is evangelize. Uh, it's not a political revival we're looking for. It's a, it's a revival of souls. And the kingdom of God comes first through the salvation of souls and the rule and reign of Christ in the hearts of men and women. And from there, the rest grows. And that's where we're at in this world. We need to focus on evangelism. And Ken Ham is going to have evangelistic messages at Living in Babylon. I would say bring your Christian, bring your friends who are not Christian. Bring your friends who need to hear the gospel because it will be present and it will be very powerfully delivered. Ken is a world-class preacher when it comes to the gospel. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to that aspect of these events as well. Leighton, thank you so much for your call. 1-800-316-316 to join in our conversation. Let's take another call, another Wendy, this one in Kununurra in Western Australia. Hey, Wendy, welcome. Hey, good morning, everybody. Well, it's still morning over here. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, I did meet him once. Uh, Martin, you came up to Kununurra many, many years ago, but I've got a just a quick question. How can I address welcome to country? So I work in a government office and these happen all the time. And some of the ones that we have on teams and everything is okay when there's a thousand people and I can always arrive late. But that's not addressing it. So how can I address that? I don't want to be part of the welcome to country. Wendy, good late. thoughts in there. And this goes through the mind of so many believers uh, welcome to country has become so common. Uh, some people are very tired of it. Uh, some people are wondering about whether this is a good thing or is this part of a woke agenda? Uh, is it something that honours our Aboriginal brothers and sisters or is it something that uh, there's more sinister uh, things behind it? Uh, Martin, your thoughts for Wendy? Yeah, I, I'm troubled by Welcome to Country just because it is an acknowledgement of the sort of um, the, 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 the kind of uh, paganistic belief that ancestral spirits um, and elders are sort of in the land, they emerge from the land and they are restored to the land and there's this continuing cycle of ancestral spirits bound up with the sort of spiritual uh, uh, brain of the, 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 that is the land itself. Um, and it, it, there is a there's a veiled acknowledgement of that in the in the basic acknowledgement of country. And so it's not something that I will say. It's not something that I will do myself. Um, now, I understand we live in a world where people do things that we don't agree with all the time. And so, uh, you know, uh, I, I put up with it when other people do it. Uh, I just remain silent and I, I, I sit there. I think of Daniel living in a pagan Babylon. He would have been surrounded by pagan practices. And the point was he never participated. They said, here, eat the, the food, which has probably been offered to idols. And he said, well, I won't do that. I know you're over there worshipping the idols, but I'm not going to eat that food. And it's the same with this. I think we know people are doing that and we know it's the world we're living in, but we're not going to do it. Uh, and uh, that's where I draw the line. And so I'd say, you know, if anybody ever sort of tried to force you to do it yourself, as in actually do a welcome to country, um, then um, that would be a time to be like Daniel and with care and discretion and, uh, you know, with, uh, with, with, with gentleness, just say, look, you just can't for religious reasons uh, and, and sort of see if, you, if God gives you favor, as he did for Daniel when Daniel made his request. Um, now... Sometimes people go well beyond welcome to country and it gets into all kinds of crazy spiritual stuff. And there is a point at which I would leave the room because um, some of that sort of uh, calling up spirits and all of that gets very nasty. And I just don't want to be a part of that. 
Thank you, Wendy in Kananara, 1-800-316-316 to join in our conversation. Let's take another call. Rose is in Brisbane. Hey, Rose, welcome. Good morning, Neil and Martin. Uh, I have a, a question. I'll just read out a scripture first. 1 Corinthians 5, 9-13. I have written to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler with such a man uh, should not even eat. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. And it comes across to me, uh, Martin, that you're vilifying the the gay community. Uh, uh, Well, what do you expect them to do? Uh, uh, Disappear? Or or what is your point in in, uh, this uh, continual... Uh, uh, negativity against the gay community. Rose, you make a really good point reading that scripture there because I know that listeners uh, will have heard there's uh, two speeds in here. There's inside the church and there's outside the church. Uh, Martin, what are your thoughts here for Rose? Well, the scripture in question is addressing the problem of having somebody who wants to persist in their uh, participation in the church and sort of masquerade as a as a Christian person and and uh, and and be inside the church world, but they've got unrepentant sin in their life. And Paul's just sort of talking about how churches should handle that situation. Uh, Rose uh, went on to address a broader thing, though, which is um, sort of the gay community at large. Uh, and I would just say one thing about the gay community or anybody um, who is not a Christian for any reason, whether it be that they want to identify with the gay community or something else. And I would just say that um, I just want them to I, I want more than anything else to see every person who is outside of Christ for whatever reason to turn from their sin, to trust the Lord Jesus Christ, find salvation and spend eternity in heaven. And I want to see them there. Uh, and I think that that is the whole purpose of human existence, is to find God, be reconciled to him, and to be able to say with the Apostle Paul, uh, you know, um, God, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst, said the Apostle Paul. He said, I'm a sinner, and Rose, I'm a sinner, and Christ saved me, and I'm so glad I realized that, and I want everybody, including the gay community, but not only them, to realize that they are sinners, and that Christ came to die for them, and I want to see them in heaven. Um, and uh, it would be amazing. And I know I was written to by a guy two weeks ago uh, who was in the gay community, watched one of my videos and actually was saved uh, and has walked away and changed. And uh, amazing little conversation I had with him, and I just praise God for all those moments. So I pray for many more to hear the gospel in the same way. Rose in Brisbane, thank you so much for your call. Let's put a line under calls now, just a few minutes for our conversation remaining. Come back to something, though, here, which connects with some of the things you're talking about now. And you've written a new book too, Martin, but we've been talking about the seduction and uh, then uh, the ongoing hostility. If you do stand up, uh, sex and sexuality and money and power Uh, there's a sense in which identity is in the mix here. And your new book is all about identity. Uh, The book's called Who Am I? Solving the Identity Puzzle. Uh, Give us some insight here because I know the book will be available during the Living in Babylon tour. And it's available right now, I guess, if people want to get a hold of it. But uh, give us your impression. How do you sum up what you've written this book for and who's it about and, uh, and what's the main message? You know, I want this book to serve as the means by which people stop looking at themselves for answers (laughs) and start looking outside of themselves and looking to God who made them and Christ who redeems and restores them. Uh, And the culture is making a terrible error here. And this is part of the pride of a Babylon culture. You know, we think that our identity is the blueprint for how we should live our lives and By identity, we mean how we feel about ourselves. Uh, 
You know, it's just come up in the last call, how we feel about our sexuality, the lusts of our hearts, where they direct us, how we feel about our gender identity, how we feel about our personality type, how we feel about our, uh, our, 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 our cultural identity. And we, we take these things and we say, that's the roadmap for how to live. And, and we have a pride movement that says, hold those things up high and make them the governing principle for your life. And the point I make in the book is that's leading us into misery. Um, it, is, uh, it is because if you look into yourself, Jesus says, you're only going to find sin. He says that which comes out of the heart of a person is what defiles them. And he lists all the sins that are in there. And we don't want to entrap people in sin. And we don't want to entrap people in themselves outside of hope, which is outside of ourselves. Um, and instead, what we want to say is, well, there's got to be a better answer, a better way, something that brings hope, something that is stable, not changing, like the changing fluidity of ourselves and, and something that is righteous, not sinful. And the answer is, well, we look to God and we look to Jesus Christ. And I go through the book of Genesis and show all the blueprints that God used when he made us, that we're made in his image, that we're made with the breath of life, that we're made male and female, and the truths that we get in God's creation design and what they mean for our lives and how they give us clarity and purpose, and then the restoration of our fallen nature in Jesus Christ as well. And the book really finishes by saying, stop asking, who am I? Instead, you should ask, who is God? Because when you find out who he is, you'll uh, the rest will fall into place because you were made to bear his image. So for all of those truths, uh, they are in the book which I've just published. It's a really big issue in this generation. And no doubt a book that you'll be able to pass on to loved ones and friends and work colleagues because moving from who am I to who is God, uh, solving that identity puzzle, keep your eye out for that book and keep your eye out for a ticket because they're getting... Uh, they're getting rarer and rarer, no doubt, even as we speak, because the Living in Babylon tour is coming up. It's just a couple of weeks away. Four dates, Adelaide on the 28th of February, Brisbane the 2nd of March, already sold out in Brisbane. Uh, there's a live stream option, though. Perth on the 4th of March and Melbourne on the 9th of March. And uh, you'll be able to participate in uh, what is going to be an amazing uh, night uh, where you'll be able to hear Martin Isles and talking through these sorts of issues around living in Babylon. And uh, you might see uh, Ken Ham in full flight in evangelist mode uh, to present the gospel and uh, to no doubt uh, have a great impact on those who are going to be attending. Now, they're big venues, so uh, there's still tickets available in some of those uh, convention and exhibition centres in those capital cities. Here's the website for you to link and uh, get a hold of a ticket, livinginbabylon.com, livinginbabylon.com. Uh, you can also uh, just check in with the answers in Genesis.org. You can find out some more about the Ark Encounter, uh, the life-size Noah's Ark, and the Creation Museum, major attractions in northern Kentucky and actually uh, global attractions, people coming from around the world to be a part of those. And our special guest this hour has been Martin Isles. He's now in his role as executive CEO of Answers in Genesis. And when I've said it's bigger than you can imagine, something like 1,500 employees in the organisation, uh, that just gives you an idea just how big things are. But Martin Isles, uh, great talking to you always and uh, look forward to catching up with you when you're on a plane and uh, on Australian soil once again in a couple of weeks. But thank you so much for talking to us today on 2020. Thank you, Neil. It's always my pleasure. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.